Hello friends, so we are bringing to you another session on megaloblastic anemia as promised and in this session we have Dr. Mrinalini go through talking to you about a simple laboratory approach to megaloblastic anemia. I'm sure you would enjoy listening to her and will gain a lot out of this particular session. Happy listening. Very good afternoon. Very good afternoon everyone. Thank you, Ashish, for letting me, uh, uh, giving me some time in this class and especially in a class where Dr. Gultu has taught the students. He has been my teacher and an uh, inspiration uh, for all of us. Whoever has been contact, in contact with him knows what a great teacher and a human being he is. So without wasting time, I'll just rush through the lab diagnosis of macrocytic anemia. And as Sir, explain how, how to, uh, just a second, how to classify a cell as macrocytic. There are two ways. One is to directly see under the uh, my microscope whether how big the cells are. And the reference which we use is the nucleus of a small lymphocyte. So this is a peripheral smear which you are seeing. Is an Big size red cell. And uh, uh, parameter is MCV, which is more than 100. So I was just showing you the peripheral smear, which showed a macrocytic cell. This is a macrocytic cell, and this is a normal site. And this is a CBC printout where you see a MCV of more than 100 to call it a macrocytic anemia. So whenever you are having a macrocytic anemia, the first question to your mind is, what is the reticular site count of that patient? So whenever you get a CBC printout, the next thing is always to see a retic count. And if you get a higher retic count, then you need to have a different set of uh, differential diagnosis in your mind. And it is either a blood loss or a hemolytic anemia. So you take a good history seeing that whether the patient had some acute blood loss or does the patient have jaundice or something else like that when you're getting a high retic count. The problem comes when you have a low or a normal retic count and then you need to take a clinical history of other systemic illnesses like liver disease, drugs and hypothyroidism. And if you do get it, then uh, probably that macrocytic anemia is because of that. Otherwise, if you're not getting a very clear cut history like that, or if the MCV is more than 110, from 100 to 110, you can entertain a variety of causes. But if you have more than 110 MCV, then you are 99% dealing with the megaloblastic anemia, and you need to do a bone marrow examination for that. Because megaloblastic, the word, is a diagnosis which you make when you see a bone marrow. Because megaloblasts are seen in the bone marrow. So that is why very often in your clinical practice, when you're getting a macrocytic anemia or a pancytopenia with some macrocytosis, you generally do a bone marrow examination in a hospital setting. But because it is an invasive procedure, then... Uh, and if the patient can afford or if it is available in your hospital, then you go for a B12 assay or a folic acid assay. So this is the picture of a reticular site uh, count. And this is how a retic count looks, reticular site looks like on supravital staining. This is a characteristic per peripheral smear picture of uh, a macrocytic anemia with which is megaloblastic in nature. And what apart from macrocytes you get are macroovalocytes. So this is a macroovalocyte, which is slightly oval in shape. You also get some teardrop cells and a hypersegmented neutrophil. So when you have a macrocytic anemia, which with the MCV of say 110, or on peripheral smear examination, if you're getting a ovalocyte, then you are almost sure you are dealing with a, bone, uh, with a megaloblastic anemia. So that is how on those lines you need to treat. And what are the causes of megaloblastic anemia? It is either a B12 deficiency, 
a folic acid deficiency, a combined deficiency of B12 or folate, or maybe because of some drugs, etc. So uh, these are the causes which have been discussed with you in detail. One little thing which I need to tell you is that sometimes when you are just looking at the CBC and you get a higher MCV, then probably uh, and uh, it could be false elevation also sometimes. And what you see is a high MCV in cold agglutination disease, hyperglycemia sometimes, and when there is marked leukocytosis because of various technical reasons. So always you need to, uh, whatever findings you get on CBC, you need to see your peripheral smear and confirm it. So when you have a megaloblastic anemia, I told you it is either a B12 deficiency, a folic acid deficiency, or some other rarer causes of uh, macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. And there is a way to go about diagnosing it. A brief mention of megaloblast. We have taught you in pathology. You all know what a megaloblast is. This is a normal erythroid maturation, which you see. In megaloblastic anemia, all these uh, steps in maturation, the cells become slightly bigger in size and the nuclear maturation lags behind. You can see here, this is how from pro to basophilic, polychromatophilic, orthochromatophilic uh, erythroid maturation occurs. So in megaloblastic, the size becomes big, the nucleus is more immature, respective to that particular age. All this, already told you most of the things. The other thing about megaloblastic elevated serum bilirubin, and it is mainly because many of these erythroid precursors, there is ineffective erythropoiesis. myeloid and the megakaryocytic precursors. So the patient may have either an anemia or a bicytopenia or a pancytopenia. So this is mainly a very basic way of coming to a lab diagnosis of a macrocytic anemia. This is the bone marrow finding and you can see here that nucleus looks immature for the size of the cell. The size is big, cytoplasm is mature, but nucleus looks more immature. So not always the patients agree to an invasive procedure like that. So we, have, we also can do serological tests, that is serum B12 assay, serum folate, folate and serum met malonic acid levels. So I'll just discuss briefly about it. So the first question in your mind is that, when should we order B12 or folic assay, folic serum folate assay? So when MCV is 100, with or without anemia, more than 100, hypersegmented neutrophils, pancytopenia of uncertain cause, unexplained neurological problems, alcoholics, malnourished, and uh, vegetarians without any history of supplementation and diabetics on metformin with a new onset nephropathy. So these are the group of patients in which without doing a bone marrow, you can straight away resort to the serological investigation. So uh, vitamin B12 level less than 100 is suggestive of a low B12, less than uh, three for serum folate, and uh, suggestive or indeterminate is when it is less than 200. Normal values of B12 are between 200 to 900. So when either of these values is there, then you can think of a B12 deficiency, similarly in folate deficiency also. 
Apart from this, the other thing is that there is methyl malonic acid uh, uh, blockage in conversion to succinyl. So there is an excess of this and homocysteine. So these are the two other very sensitive methods by which you can do uh, a diagnosis of B12 folate deficiency, especially when B12 and folic acid uh, is not uh, is giving very equivocal results. So this is just a checklist for that. If it is less than 100, the B12 levels, then you can straight away go for a B12 deficiency. But if it is a borderline or an intermediate and patient is having macrocytic anemia or patient is very symptomatic or is pancytopenic, then you can check the serum, uh, serum methyl malonic acid and homocysteine level. And then accordingly decide whether uh, there is B12 deficiency or not. Still, the most often used and most clinically important is a therapeutic trial. And uh, when, the, when you get a therapeutic dose of B12 or and folic acid, we check for the response. The first is the clinical response and patients with the deficiency start responding clinically within days. And the, uh, the, and the hemoglobin and the megaloblast are disappearing within 24 hours. Such is the rapid response to the supplementation. And this is actually one of the most reliable ways of finally diagnosing B12 and folic deficiency. So we check for a retic count, which is the objective measure on day seven day six or day seven, and eventually the rise in hemoglobin. So this is in short about the lab diagnosis of megaloblastic anemia. And I'll just give a brief recap. First is to establish that there is macrocytosis for which you see the peripheral smear and the MCV. Then you see the peripheral smear for other findings like macrovalocytes and hypersegmented neutrophils and MCV more than 110, which is also suggestive of megaloblastic. You rule out uh, causes of high reticulocyte counts and other systemic illnesses. And then you can either go for a bone marrow and a therapeutic trial. Or you can also support your diagnosis by B12 and folic acid assay. Thank you so much. That brings me to the end of this uh, a little introduction to lab diagnosis. Thank you. This was Dr. Mrinalini talking about uh, a laboratory approach to megaloblastic anemia. I'm sure you enjoyed listening to her. And stay tuned for more on megaloblastic anemia coming soon. Thanks for stopping by.